You're listening to episode 285 of the Major Issues Podcast, and in this one, to pay respects to Ray Stevenson, we are going to review Punisher Warzone 15 years from its debut. The Major Issues Podcast starts right now! Hello everybody out there in comic book land, my name is George Serrano, aka The Don, and if you're listening to this, you can only be here for one reason, and that's a brand new episode of the Major Issues Podcast, brought to you each and every week by ComicBookClick.com, and as always, I am never alone, sir, if you could please introduce yourself. I, I, I don't know if they'll remember me. <laughs> it is Dan, the comic book man, everybody, hello out there in comic book land. It is lovely to hear and see all of you. Out here in comic book land, but I am glad you have returned. We are here uh, to pay tribute to someone who has done some beautiful things in uh, comic book medium. But also, I brought you on to tackle some current news stories, uh, rumors, and scuttlebutt out there. So before we get into our main course, which is going to be uh, Punisher Warzone, which is um, not only a film not on many people's radar, uh, obviously starting the late uh, Ray Stevenson, who just lost his life not too long ago. Um, we would have done this episode last week, but Spider-Verse <laughs> was out. Uh, so I still wanted to pay tribute by watching this film that you had recommended to me a long time ago. It's one of the only Marvel films, if probably not the only Marvel film um, that I haven't seen. So I am going to be mums the word about how I felt about it up until we get to our review. But um, yeah, that's that's the main topic here today. But I want to talk about Spider-Man a little bit for a bit, because uh, as of recording, the box office for Across the Spider-Verse has surpassed the entire first film's box office <laughs> for the like entirety. Gross in general. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, um, it is at 384 million globally currently. Um, so I think the other, uh, I'm trying to figure out what the, what the first one was. Um, I probably ended up being 120 million overall. I'll tell you right now. Oh, sorry, let me tell you right now. Into the spec, because, yeah, here we go. You got it right now. Into the Spider Verse made three hundred and eighty four point three million on a ninety million budget. Into, into, okay. Into the Spider Verse made three hundred and eighty four point three million. Okay, so it's like it's probably like at three eighty five or something like that. Three uh, across the Spider Verse made three hundred and eighty nine point nine nine eighty nine. Okay. So it yeah. made, so it made about five, in, in, in a ballpark sense six million more, or six, yeah, that's a yes. million. That that that's amazing. Uh, no pun intended. Spectacular, etc. So well, far, also had a ten million dollar more. Um, yeah, a ten million dollar more budget with a hundred million as its budget. Yeah, but like, if you're able to then use that tenfold, that's amazing, right? Like, if you put in ten million more dollars into production. Uh, and then end up making a hundred million more <laughs> overall. That's the lesson that you should learn from no, this. It, it is it is kind of crazy what Spider Man what across the Spider Verse made in its one week is what Into made in its entire theater run. Yeah, and Into is still an Oscar winner movie. Well, that was another thing that we were talking about when we were talking about our review. Is like it came out in December, and by February, when the actual Oscars came out, it was nominated, and you know they brought it in. So yeah, I guess this this it's word of mouth is out there. It's it's making it popular. It's making it uh, and and you know well deserved. I'm happy that this film is getting the success that I think it deserves. Um, I'm interested in seeing how the rest of this goes because if I'm not mistaken, that recent Transformers movie kind of uh, topped this past weekend's box office. So. Across is that was also one. a very highly anticipated movie. Like this was the like we've been waiting for specifically Beast Wars yeah. for like how long? Well, and then my, we didn't get the Beast Wars, but 
we're still we got our beast transformers my argument though is that it's never going to stop being the anticipated thing right because flash is next right oh, of <laughs> so and this and so, summer you still have barbie you still yeah. have oppenheimer you still have yeah. mission impossible i think this is going to be the last mission impossible that's in a two-parter so like you know every week every other week is going to be a most anticipated movie of the year that th- that name started getting less and less relevant right mission impossible with the with the, with the <laughs> honestly with like the, I, I don't not know. the movies the movies are are actually getting better as they've been going on but i'm talking about the name no, the like, name yeah i'm thinking yeah. about it too it's like you know if you have if you you could probably change the name of like the last four of these films and to be no fair one, they, I, they've been calling the last ones by their subtitles haven't they like you'll just say hey you see fallout Rogue nation yeah <laughs> since rogue nation it's been that way it's like have you seen rogue nation have you seen ghost protocol yeah yeah so that's basically that anyway um but yeah, it's going to have some heavy contenders. I really want to see where this goes. I hope it goes very well. Um, regardless, we know that there's already a sequel. Uh, we're not spoiling the first installment of this <laughs> three, uh, you know, the second installment of this three part series, but there is going to be a sequel beyond the Spider Verse plan for 2024. Um, what I like, uh, or what I think I like on paper, is that if they're already shooting for a 2024 release date, then they're already working on this stuff, which means that they can't be swayed by last minute knee jerk reactions from this movie making a bunch of money. No, no, no. And, you know, they're, they're doing like this like how Matrix did it. They're they, they're they're shooting Reloaded and Revolutions back to back. Yeah, um, and but that's also good because they that means they know the story that they want to tell. Um, regardless of that, we know that there's a supposedly a Spider Gwen spinoff in the works possibly animated uh that would make most sense they have an entire series of source material if they wanted to go off of that um um, i'm interested in how what the future incorporation of this spider-verse is going to be because all they said was this was going to be the end of miles's trilogy they didn't say anything about the spider-verse in general the animation uh universe they've created for themselves and there's there's so much they can do like what you said with yeah you know the spider gwen like you know Haley steinfeld can continue it but there's like just it's there's there's a realm of spider-man that you can now pull from you can give us that that uh prequel to across the spider-verse with the miguel o'hara story i kind of want to see oh yeah that yeah you can follow peter b parker i want to see some may day growing up matter of fact that's all renew your vows right there that's all 100%. you know with 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 uh grown up uh, may day parker what's interested or what's interesting to me is that i just this just solidifies the fact that sony's not giving up <laughs> spider-man anytime soon man no no no, no. Um, especially with this movie being a literal love letter to spider-man yeah that's and not the, happening anytime and, soon. And the, and the money that it's raking in. And just when you think that this is going to be at the height of its powers with the money that it's raking in, we finally have a release date for Spider-Man 2 on PS5. Uh, it's coming to us in October. I want to say it's October. Which I'm pre-ordering as soon as I can. It, uh, it's coming to us. Why am I not? Oh, yeah, you go. Friday, October 20th, 2023. Um... I, I dig it. I I have now recently started playing Marvel Spider Man on New Game Plus, I'm having a lot of fun doing that. I just love that game. I love its dynamic. I love its um. Well, those of those that don't know, you're the reason why I why I have a PlayStation and why. I, oh. Well, besides Greg, but when I went to your crib in Florida, all you oh, did yeah. was throw on that game, throw me the controller, and said play. Yeah, it was and amazing. I, and yeah, it it is. It truly is. Like if you like, it's the same way how I feel about the Guardians of the Galaxy video video game. Like, yeah, taken as just the story and the cutscenes that you get of both those games, they might be the best stories of those characters ever written. I will say, like even after Part Three of Guardians, that video game right there is probably the best story you'll ever get of the Guardians on screen. Yeah, and I think the what the, the thing that makes both of those things work is they understand that they're allowed to be variants of the mainline characters that we do know. You know, there are slight changes in both the Guardians um, 
video game, like those characters and the characters we've read in the comics and the characters that we've seen in the MCU, just like there's differences in this Spider-Man here. Like everyone was going crazy talking about, oh, you know, Venom is not Eddie Brock, right? And I won't spoil it, but it's quite clear who Venom is <laughs> if you played the first Spider-Man game. I didn't think that that was news, but I didn't realize that everyone may not have played it. Um, this is possibly one of the biggest games, but I guess you could say that almost about any PlayStation game, right? Like one of the biggest games that is only available to no, uh, no, no. Know, when it comes when it comes to if, a, we're, if we're gonna talking about that, like specifically of you probably I'm have about God of War. Uh, you know. Exactly, you have four titles under your belt with Sony of like the biggest games, and that's well, no longer with The Last of Us, but right now it's Horizon, God of War, and definitely Assassin's Creed because they're going back to their old ways. Yeah. Assassin's Creed was like this weird role-playing game for a while like i don't know what they did with the last like 10 years of assassin's creed but they're going back to how assassin's creed used to be when it was numbered and that's going to probably going to be my most anticipated game next to spider-man yeah um they showed some footage we see that the symbiote suit is there that's going to be really cool um miles is now on here i'm like just so happy with how miles has raised to a a tier character um because he's still getting shit in the comics to be honest like if you know he's still getting relegated and some questionable suit changes and uh you know a bunch of that stuff um didn't he get like nicknamed in in because they don't want to like straight up call him spider-man and like spidey and friends isn't he like some other name he's 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 not no in, Sp in the spidey and friends where it's miles it's like, gwen and, and parker yeah yeah I he's can't something different what, they gave him like another like spider kind of nickname or something um it's but, kind of the year of doing the sidekicks wrong because i don't know if you talked about it on here which i'm probably sure you did but they're doing they did kamala wrong that's all i'm saying oh yeah kamala uh, khan is currently going through something here now but i i think that um they're i think that what's going on with kamala right now in the comics is all to lead up to her being closer to what she is in the mcu and then they're going to find a way. And when she does make her triumphant return, as most of these characters in this situation do, she somehow is going to have crystal powers and crystal, you know, do crystal stuff. And she you know, won't at be the, at, stretchy at McStretcherson anymore. At this point, I, I, I'll I just go with it because, look, I, I don't know if it's the universe laughing at me, but for three movies now, because I saw Guardians Part 3 once in theaters, but I saw Spider-Verse two times in theaters in the same weekend. And for all three movies, and surprisingly, The Little Mermaid, I got Miss Marvel trailers. I had to watch uh, the Marvel. I haven't seen. I haven't seen one in a bit. I don't know why they're not showing it. Mines, but they, George, they showed it in Guardians, Little Mermaid, and twice in Spider Man. I've seen the Marvels trailer four times on the big screen, and at this point now, I kind of rather just see it. Like I kind of just want to see it now. I, it's like I'm not. I'm not. I'm definitely not against the Marvels. I don't expect. I wasn't a huge fan of. The Captain Marvel thing movie, and it wasn't like the Brie Larson of it all. But I, think I it just was the felt like, yeah, I just felt like there was a way to get to where they wanted to get with that character without, you know, it's like I, uh, it, um, we used to call it like wrestling terms, like booking yourself into a corner. You know, you would say something like, um, bro, like, um, th th this movie was boring. The character for the first half an hour limped, like, like. I only had one leg and limped to his destination in almost like real time. And then somebody would be like, well, the character had to limp because they cut his leg off in the first act. And it's like, well, then don't cut his leg off. In the first like, it was your creative choice. You're to literally do that. explaining the first Ant Man movie. Yeah, it's that's like, the funniest part. You've, you've created a scenario that now you have to dig yourself out of, which is making the story now fail. You know, they gave her, in my opinion, giving her amnesia was kind of weird. And that was, the worst, had, that like, was the worst part of it, yeah. Because they gave her amnesia, they had to work now retroactively to explain everything. It's a mystery to us. It's a mystery to them. We only get flashbacks. So by, like, by the time you get to the end of that movie, you just realize what was already established prior to the amnesia, <laughs> which, if you, which could have been the starting point <laughs> from the beginning, and you could have went further, but it said you went backwards to go to get to where you My were. issue with the amnesia is it, it's not that it, it's the backtracking or like having to get there. It's just by the time it got there for me, it's like, well, okay, all of the best scenes were literally in like the first 20 minutes or in the middle of the movie. 
The yeah. best part of that movie was the, was punching the old lady on the bus. Well, I like when I like when she like did all that stuff in front of Ronan. That was pretty cool. Um, but but yeah, Iman, whatever her last name is, Vilani. she's killed. It, I keep saying Vitaly. I don't know why. <laughs> you know, Iman Vellani. Yeah, she's she's killing it right now. It's one of those things where it's like for me to enjoy the things that I'm enjoying in the MCU. I have to focus on them as they come and quite literally the things that are not actually in front of me i don't think about <laughs> so like loki i haven't thought about loki in a very long time i know it's loki season two is coming and it's coming soon we just dropped the release date not too long ago um you know what's but, the weirdest part about that i feel the same way with i was thinking about that with moon knight yeah it's like I'm not, i know moon knight season two is coming but it's like yeah. i haven't thought about moon knight since this since the finale Right, and so like right now, my whole brain is in um, Spider Verse, even though Guardians was not that long ago. You know, like Guardians was right around the corner, and like, but because that story is closed and Spider Verse is still open, my mind is still <laughs> in Spider Verse while simultaneously accepting and appreciating Guardians. So yeah, it's one of those things right now where we we're almost um, have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to these choices in the theaters and now in the video games. So you know we're putting our it's money been where that way we're for at. like fifteen years now. It's been that way for so long thirteen exactly thirteen years it's been because I think on, what, MCU? yeah because I think Iron Man turns like thirteen like doesn't he turn thirteen this month? No, it's fifteen years this year. Same similar with uh, the movie that we're talking about today. Uh, 15 oh, years right yeah 15 years like iron man turns 15 years old we for for that long for almost two decades we've just been getting spoiled i will never forget 2016 just being the summer everything came out or it was yeah. like no it was 2014 2014 was the summer everything came out from days of future past to amazing spider-man 2 to winter soldier like we got yeah. everything yeah and yeah like you said it just yeah, there was a while in which I felt like the companies and the studios um, dictated what the fans wanted, and now I feel like it's almost the fans, you know, showing with their money what they want, and a lot of the times it's quality stuff. So, you know, there's there's still some things here and there that are a bit hollow that can still manage to generate a bunch of money, but a lot of, especially I think when it comes to video games, I feel like the highest selling grossing uh, video games. Uh, are that way because of the amount of uh, heart and stuff that they're able to put into it uh, story-wise graphics all that kind of stuff like you know and i know that there's like crunch and evil game studios that make people <laughs> work 14 hour days to try to push out titles on time etc and so forth um but when these things are a labor of love whether they're films or video games it, it, to me it really shows so i'm really digging on that um, yeah, because the older we get, the more we have to realize people our age are the ones now running things. Yeah, yeah. These, these older folks can't last forever. They, you know, they're they're gonna go out soon. You know that that light will flicker. So all the people that grew up in the eighties and nineties are gonna be the ones running these things. Nerds will be running the world in less than ten years. Yeah, and. You know, the other side of that is the older ones that are not running it anymore don't really care where the money comes from <laughs> and don't really care. You know what I'm saying? So they're like, what? What? The flying raccoon, the raccoon in the tree? Yeah, whatever. I don't care. Just if you're saying Make that me money. what we're going to get into, then fine. Let's go and do that, which, you know, uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, now, in an attempt to tiptoe through a uh, – wait, are you supposed to um, – Walk on eggshells or walk around yes. eggshells. Obviously, not walk on eggshells, right? No, it's, it's, it's walking on eggshells. That's the worst part about it. It's it's called I'm walking on eggshells around you. It's like wait, wait what? Okay, okay, yeah. Walking on eggshells. If the eggshells were all made of miniature grenades, um, I think all of this this obsession over Gwen. <laughs> And her sexuality in Spider Verse has been absolutely insane, and I think that a film can be supportive of communities without trying to secretly, <laughs> you know, make implant, everybody part of the community. Yeah, without trying to secretly implant um, 
agenda or, you know, it like I always feel like you'll hear people say things like that movie was good because it didn't push agendas, whatever. And, I'm, and I almost always say, oh, it did. But you didn't see it like it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't a heavy handed. The best example that we can know? give, it will always be. And I know people might laugh. It's always sunny. Yeah, it's always sunny to this day proves you can be an ally and you can be progressive and you can also have a message that everybody can pull from. Yeah, their their use their use of the character of Carmen has been seen as one of the greatest uses of that community in television, yeah. and they juxtapose it to things like um, how I met your mother and stuff like that. Yeah, watching unserious people seethe at this weird thing that's not a thing. It's just, I feel like, takes away from a, an incredible film that's that's doing incredibly well. And um, I hope, it's it's like watching like my kid at softball, right? And someone, people are just talking about his like, shoe being untied. Whatever, you know, like, <laughs> I'm upset that people were, are missing would possibly be a great uh, outing here because they're focusing on the wrong. And I think the I think the beauty of that is all right. This is what I personally said when what when that when I was watching the movie. Besides mm -hmm. the fact that once the movie started with that score, I said I'm in, I'm here. Mm -hmm. You have my yeah. attention. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Once we get all of the Gwen stuff, I remember saying to myself, "Huh, the watercolors?" Because I've I've I read Gwen comics maybe like ten years ago. Maybe yeah. no, because I'm 30 now. Jesus Christ. I read Gwen comics 15 years ago when it first started becoming big, like the Gwen Stacy uh, Spider-Man comics. I remember when they became big. So I don't really remember much of the artwork. So if anybody told me, oh, that's the actual artwork of the comic, I would believe them. But when the movie started and they showed all of her watercolors and her world, the first thing I said was, wow, it's kind of beautiful that this is all shot with like bisexual colors because right. it is it's shot with the with, with with the purple and the pink and the blue mm -hmm. and they blend together so well and it's almost selected colors because in those moments with with uh captain stacy where he's like conflicted and doesn't know what to do you get these shots of him in orange while she's in blue yeah and i'm like god damn you people know what you're doing so so the thing is, um, I can't argue for what the intentions of the creators are, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not obviously not them, but I do know that one of the things that was stated about Gwen's world was that the way that they wanted to portray it was that it was sort of a mood ring. So mm. as as emotion shifted, people were shown in different colors as, as emotions moved, and you know things melted in the background. When Gwen mm. was cold to her father, she's blue. When, and when she goes and she embraces him, the red pulls out of both of them, you know, pushes out of both of them, I could say, or the glow pushes out of both of them. Yes. And, and that's that's all Lord and Miller, because if it, you remember they, all of yeah. the stuff from the Lego movie and the Lego Batman movie and how emotions was used with toys, that's all Lord and Miller. I feel like the, the film was um, choosing style over the... Um, already established easy to understand language of cinema which is a choice right you have to make that choice you have to say you know be besides just showing these people in one one color to you know like because you can put a uh like seven right seven has a color grade and that grade is to tell a story and you can certainly do that and keep one film in all one color grade but they didn't even choose to stay in one animation style <laughs> like at all points each scene had to tell its own story using its use of animation color sound etc and you know for 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 us to talk about all that and for people to say oh there's a support trans kids or protect trans kids flag and go on a 30 minute rant on about that is what i feel like is the major tragedy of this conversation which because i feel like spider-man would save everybody he doesn't web sling down and say what are your pronouns even though he probably would ask that i'm saying like he doesn't choose based and he doesn't pick and choose based on what what you identify as which you know? i think was the funniest thing that i like 
I, I say to this day, thank God not enough people played Gotham Knights, even though it's a great game. It is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Thank God it didn't get the buzz it did because there is legit a pride flag in oh. <laughs> in the Bat Cave, like where all of the all four of the Bat family chill, that little house or the loft. Yeah. If you go upstairs, there is a pride flag for, you know, Tim Drake. I about to say for Tim, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because. You know, Tim. Oh, t- oh, Timmy. And I also, I, I I was playing the Spider-Man game, and I don't know if it was during Pride Month or if it was just part of the game, but there is a section in the city where you can find a Pride flag. Yeah. If you're swinging through, boop. And, and I'm like, God damn. I want to say people- there's some Black Lives Matter stuff in the Miles game. Um, and I know and it that... it would just upset people for no reason. Well, Why? that's the thing. There's a scene where... Um, that okay. Here's a perfect example, and then we'll move on. There's a scene where um, Miles is talking to his counselor with his parents, and he has his book bag with him. On his book bag is a button. On that button it says BLM. Right? You like that's the statement that they're making, and that statement uh, that they're it's making woke. there. It's woke. woke. Well, saying, that's that's the statement that they're making woke there. Uh, you know, for people to go from there and pull and pull and pull, it just it boggles my mind and we have posted something that's doing relatively well on um well, i think we talked about a scene or quoted a scene on facebook and people are talking about what their reactions were to it and then someone just oh, comments. when rio was talking to her it made yeah. me that made me cry and then somebody just commented all lives matter like <laughs> you know and it's just like it's not huh. even what the oh, what we're talking about wait here. a minute where did where does the brain go so I saved your Jimmy Uso react picture, and that's what I've been using for, uh, or Jay Uso, where he's just looking <laughs> like he's uh, disgusted, <laughs> and I've been using that as my react picture. <laughs> but yeah, man, like I said, I fuck, I love people of all shapes and colors. But I don't. The only people I don't dig are the people who say that other people shouldn't exist. <laughs> Ironically, that's the only no, people yeah, I, I have no tolerance for people's lack of tolerance. <laughs> you know. And don't get it twisted. There's extremes on on both sides. I'm not saying that, you know, everything under the sun, I understand completely or I, you know, but like people just let people live, you know, let them live. As long as you're not a rapist or a pedophile, you know, I don't care about these. Which are two things we haven't been able to eradicate. So the fact that we're working on everything else feels very strange. (laughs) Like chemically castrate and bury them under the prison. It's simple. It's simple. Well, I know one man who would agree with you. And that man is Frank Castle. You will never lose your ability to have an amazing segue. We are here <laughs> to talk about Punisher Warzone in uh you know, in memoriam of our man Ray Stevenson. Um do you have a big history with this gentleman? Do you remember um, okay, so... seeing him in things? I know you watch more films and um Towards the end, I'll give you a chance to actually plug some uh, project you'll be working on uh, soon. But yeah, do you remember, uh, you know, him being one of those like that guys from SVU or something like that? No. Okay. So Ray Stevenson and God rest his his soul. The very first time I ever watched Ray Stevenson was Punisher Warzone. Okay. And I I will never forget it. It was like two o'clock in the morning. Now this is this has been something that I've done since I was literally knee high to a duck. Like mm-hmm. I I will, if I can't sleep, I will just circulate the original four movie channels over and over until, well, three, the original three movie channels until I find something, which is HBO. No, it's four. HBO, Showtime, Cinemax, and Stars. Okay. From the time I was, I was like seven, to even now, it's just something I've always done. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't feel like playing a video game. What am I going to do? I'm going to go to channel 301 to channel 4, 499. Because you get HBO, HBO 2, HBO West, HBO Kids, HBO Max, Encore. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. So but never what you first... want to find. <laughs> yeah, so, so I will never forget. It was like two o'clock in the morning, and I saw Punisher Warzone started like five minutes ago, and I turned it on and I watched that. From then, I didn't see him in anything until Book of Eli, and then after that, Thor. 
Thor and Thor Dark Worlds, but I barely recognized him even like the same way I barely recognized Carl Urban. And that oh, man yeah, has a recognizable yeah, yeah. face. But I totally forget to this day Carl Urban was in Thor. Imagine being a Who fan and seeing uh, Christopher Eggleston just caked in makeup where he can't even move. <laughs> oh my God! You would you would watch the first season of Jessica Jones solely for uh, for Kilgrave. Yeah, David Tennant. Yeah, just don't watch nothing for Matt Smith because Jesus, why do people like Matt? Smith? I'm not even gonna start with so on his Matt big, Smith. So his big, yeah, his film debut was in 1998. So he had only been in film for 10 years when you see him in Punisher Warzone. But he has a film in 98, 99, 2002, 2004, one in 2008, and then Punisher. So Punisher was just his sixth film, even though he had been in television since 1993. And again, just a couple of episodes, some made-for-TV movies, et cetera, and so forth. Because he's a British actor. Irish? Northern Ireland? Irish? Northern, oh. Nor Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, he's known for... Um, playing before being in the king arthur film in 2004 uh he was in yes, rome that's right. um, i have never seen rome but fun weird fun fact someone gave me i think it was a cousin of mine or something someone gifted me the first season of rome for christmas oh really and i never saw it but that's someone gave me a family member gave me the first season of rome that seems randomly specific <laughs> so random. maybe they knew something about the show and you that and nobody else I mean, knew. I do, I do, I do like my history, and I do like Roman history, Greek history, Egyptian history. I do like all that, but it was just so weird. Someone gave me the first season of Rome on DVD. <laughs> he was in Black Sails. He was in Dexter. He was in the Three Musketeers uh, film from 2011. Uh, he was in RRR, which everyone was talking about. Have yet I personally have yet to see rr but i personally have yet to be able to commit three hours and 45 minutes to a movie <laughs> he was in the other guys he was in the other guys yes he was um he plays frank castle in both punisher warzone which we'll be talking about but he also plays him in the superhero squad show which what? why why is why is punisher on the superhero squad show <laughs> Like, I like just, a, yeah, it's like a yeah. Disney show. I do not understand. Yeah, very, very weird. Uh, maybe it's just it's like the a fact cameo that they once pulled twice, Ray like, Stevenson to voice him. Like, they could have gotten, but both really phoned both. in anybody. He shouldn't be. I don't know if he should be it. I, but then I guess that goes to, you know, whether or not he's being comics. That's a whole other conversation for another day. Um, you know, people like Mike Zapsick and Walter, Walt, Walt Flanagan, Kevin Smith's boys. From the podcast mm -hmm. men or uh, comic book men, they despise the very nature of Frank Castle. They don't believe people like Frank Castle should be considered heroes, superheroes, comic book heroes. They should be villains. Mm -hmm. But I found I found that a lot of people do think that if you're going to be a superhero, you cannot kill. You can't take that that's, absolute. Yeah, that's how a lot of people. And then you know there are, obviously is. A whole plethora of anti-heroes, Wolverine, you know, et cetera and so forth. Venom so, at some point. Yeah, yeah. So um, let me tell you some things about Punisher Warzone before uh, we get into it. So originally this film was going to be a sequel, a direct sequel to the 2004 The Punisher starring Thomas Jane. Um, it was going to be set five years after that film and we'll see Frank Castle arrive in New York, taking on Jigsaw, who's trying to control the criminal underworld. Um, but Thomas Jane turned it down, saying that he thought the script was going in the wrong direction. Uh, he felt like the film was too comic book, whereas he wanted a more gritty slash realistic approach. This is the problem with stuff like Nolan's Batman, and as much as I love Nolan's Batman. Oh, that would have just... This came out after that right like between 2005 here and is yeah 2000 this a year Dark after Knight, yeah yeah the, the batman begins comes out a year after the first punisher or yeah. the second filmed punisher i could see that you could i think you know just hero films in general are, are rising you know in a certain kind of way of in terms of seriousness um so 
the script ended up being rewritten by uh, for Ray Stevenson. You know, Ray Stevenson was ends up getting brought in uh, as Frank Castle. Um, Sons of Anarchy creator Kurt Sutter wrote a R-rated draft that, according to him, took the Punisher character out of comic books and put him into a real-world drama set in the streets of New York. However, at the last minute, the studio decided to revert to Nick Santora's comic book style script with the intention of creating a sequel from that. Disgusted by the actions of the studio, Sutter refused a story credit and demanded that his name be omitted from the final credits. Wow. And now that I, now that I like, because I, what I know from Sons of Anarchy to now what I know of Punisher Warzone from a, a rewatch. <laughs> yeah. Jesus I cannot believe Kurt, this. Yeah, th this mm -hmm. is Kurt. This is Kurt Sutter's work. A lot of this story is one hundred percent Kurt Sutter's work. It's a damn strange, uh, damn uh, shame. Then, right? No, it's almost like how uh, Quentin Tarantino hates being credited as the writer of True Romance. <laughs> After creating a soundtrack from the film, I also want to say, uh, before I even talk about this film, whether or not I liked it, I think some credit should be given to director Lexi Alexander, uh, one of the first female-led uh, directors of a superhero film. Um, I know Patty Jenkins was uh, possibly going to do Thor at one point, Thor Dark World. She eventually didn't, but this would have been years before even that, 2008, you know? So that so after creating a soundtrack for the film with a composer, Lexi Alexander was upset by Lionsgate decision to not only fire her composer, but to make a significantly darker orchestral soundtrack to the film. It was cited that the studio's decision for this was to make the film appear more like The Dark Knight, which was released <laughs> that same <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and you know what the worst part was? I the heard score. there was a secret chord. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the man. worst part is, is when you listen to the score, the actual real score that I guess the studio decided on, it does sound a mix between like Zimmer's work, but it sounds like they were trying to go for the original Punisher score from 04. This, I couldn't plug this in anywhere. I felt like they just didn't have it like no no music that really grabbed the me. Which, wasn't important. To, but it to be important. honest, to be honest, that's music that's in my opinion, movies of this entire era. Because one thing I don't know if we covered here on this podcast, I have a strong disdain for early two thousands uh movies. You know, because I feel like they You have a, a huge disdain and it's the the best part about it is is of all of them, the one that takes the cake is your hatred for early two thousands raunch comedies. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, they're all the American I, Pies, all the Road Trip, they're Wet Hot like American God. Summer. It was, like one time jokes are funny the first time, past that. Uh but um yeah, so I guess it didn't really uh it hadn't really got thrown at me, uh, the music in this. Um, let me see if there's anything. Else. So Doug Hutchinson originally passed on the project because he didn't respond to the script, nor the role of Looney Bin Jim, um, who that's who it was. <laughs> but she called him to to pitch the movie and her vision. And by the end of the conversation, he was like, "All right, I'll do it." Pat, uh, Patty. Constantine. I know it sounds like I'm saying Constantine. It's C O N S I D I N E. Considine. Considine? Yeah, yeah. Considine sounds like it makes the most sense. Patty Considine almost played um, Jigsaw. I'm trying to see where you would know him from. I, 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 once, once you said almost played Jigsaw, I, I said, I. I I do not know who that man is. He played King Viserys in House of Dragon. I have not seen House of Dragons. <laughs> that's I, the one I won't thing. do it. That's the I one. won't do it. That's the one thing. I won't I won't do it. Um he played Stephen Prince in the world's end. I don't know what any of those characters. Okay, are I know named I, I know what it is. I then I know because I've seen the world's end. That's part of the Cornetto trilogy. Uh, he played right. D S Andy Wainwright in Hot Fuzz. <sighs> oh, Okay, okay, okay. I know who we're talking about now. 
He's in Cinderella Man too, but I don't know if that matters. I I haven't seen Cinderella Man since I was a kid. Um. Okay. Yeah. So, do, 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 trying to see if there's any other addition because I think adding putting all this together kind of sets up <laughs> a lot of this. Um. Oh gosh. According to director Lexi Alexander, the day she was to do to meet with Marvel executives to discuss the movie was the day after the Virginia Tech massacre. The news report she watched features footage of the shooter's room in which a Punisher poster was prominently displayed. She asked to reschedule the meeting and decided to exaggerate the violence in the film so that viewers could not attempt to recreate the scenes way to work around that i guess <laughs> um i feel like that's what i someone was talking about that the other day where they were like oh man like they were talking about some like i don't know if it was like a gun themed shirt or something and somebody was like oh we gotta be careful where you know uh, careful when you came out with that or whatever because it could have been close to a day of a mass shooting and i was like that's hit or miss bro that's like once a week like you can't you can't avoid you can't avoid that shit here and so i can see why people are not hopping to do this kind of stuff in film a burnt is still supposed to be coming back to the mcu as we know it uh to play punisher but there has been a lot of discussion about what who, what and who the character of frank castle slash punisher should be uh, i mean given our sense, history of spider-man slack for for being pro police in the video game yeah, they yeah. Get, it, the, come on now. It's honestly, it's getting to the point where you're you have to just laugh at everybody. Progressive, yeah. regressive, doesn't matter. Left, right, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, up, down, left, right. You just have to laugh at everybody. Yeah, and um, I guess well, two thousand and eight, I would have been in the military. Uh, so that's another reason why this movie is not like um. Like, that's another reason why this movie, I guess, skipped past my radar was because I would have been heavily doing that and not really going to the theaters all too much. 2009, I would have been in Iraq. Uh, so I think even in December of 2008, I was probably like training for all that kind of stuff, uh, all of the all the big stuff that I was going on there. And then people didn't say much of it. So that's another hey, reason I didn't why catch this I movie until like three years later. Yeah. I caught and this on Showtime on Extreme. Yeah, I caught it on Showtime Extreme at like 2 o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, Punisher Warzone. I have never even heard of this movie. 2008. Is this Thomas Jane? Who's Ray Stevenson? I have no idea who this is. At the end of the movie, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Th this is rated R, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is rated R, which is how the Punisher should be. I will say that. Um, this is like I, the second R-rated comic book movie because this is always one of the ones that I say when people are like oh Deadpool was the first R-rated comic book movie I'm like have you guys never heard of is the Punisher Thomas Warzone? Jane one the PG-13 it is PG-13 there's like huh. nothing in there's like the, the violence is so minimal almost, almost all of the big extreme kills that you would think is gore is like off screen Two of the only gore, no, I guess three, would be mm -hmm. the blade through the mouth, the arrow through the neck, and Kevin Nash getting oil thrown on him. Yeah, that's really it. You're right. They kind of um, they kind of cut off screen for Ben Foster getting all the piercings ripped out of his face. You never saw any of that. So the film was supposed to come out in September. It ended up getting pushed to December. There was a lot of rumors that they were going to take the director off of it. Uh, she said that she did not get final cut privilege of the film, but she was extremely happy with how the film came out. Um, it is probably going to go down as one of the lowest gro grossing Marvel films of all time, just based on the numbers, because uh, with a budget of $35 million, it made $10 million. So Jesus Christ, that that's, is that's not bad. a lot. That's bad. Yeah, that's not a lot at all. Um, but in respect to um, Mr. Stevenson himself and the fact that I've never seen this film, are you ready to get fully into 
Punisher War Zone. I have been anticipating <laughs> your that you guys have to understand. This man had this movie on DVD just as a collection. Yeah, just sitting there ca- with go, the intention ca- gathering dust for for the intended to watch it. And I couldn't allow this to just be a commentary track. This had to be something that I know you had to have your full attention because it was, th- there was only two routes that this was going to go in my head. Either this was going to be w- like one of the definitive standout Punisher performances for you, or this was going to be one of the worst movies you've ever seen on par with Elektra. If you had to make a bet, what would you say? If I had to genuinely place money down, I, ge- I would put this as you would find this to be either under a great film or a harmless film. Like, I can't see you. I can't genuinely see you hating this film if you loved the, the Bernthal Punisher. I can see that. Uh, I can see that take. I really like this film. I, I knew it. I, I, I really it. I, I really like this movie. And the. I think what I like the most about this film is that a lot of it was just basically competent like it was just it was by the numbers the 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 plot is very easy to follow even though sometimes um it's a bit expository because it has to you know get get to certain points um well, I, I think, think that's that, the newman of it all the wayne knight his character the that happens but, he, but they also the goons do it right they yeah, all, that's true. And that they do that in every movie. The goons do it in every movie. It's like, oh well, you know, and you know that crime family on thirty fifth. Yeah, I know that crime family. It's like, yeah, it's all that. I but that's it. also with the use of the cops. The yes. cops in movies are always expository. Um, the only person slash thing I had an issue in, which is probably something that I've talked about many times here before. I and I'm glad it didn't go all the way where I thought it was going to go, but I didn't like the whole like widow daughter uh, yep, sur- yep, yep, surrogate yep, yep, yep. family. I know thing how you feel about that. They, that that one. they tend to want to do with this character. It, I find it kind of weird and I find it kind of creepy. Um, well, it's only because this one I get because like this was his legit actual partner. Yeah. Like the, the, that family wasn't just some random cop family that. He has to like throw his own insecurities and trauma into. This was his legit uh, partner on the force. So like well, that, he caused it. He caused this the death of those, this widow. And he and exactly. So that's you know, also, obviously that's he guilt. has his own opinion. Yeah, but then you can't. I was afraid this film was going to turn it back around into like a romance of sorts. You understand what I'm saying? I, I thought that. I know what you mean. I know what you I mean. I thought that she was being set up as like the damsel that like she would then be like, oh my God, thank you, Frank Castle, smooch, smooch. Which I, I don't think which was the with problem with the 04 one. Yeah. That was well, 100% and, the problem with that one. Um, What else? I will say, because we're going to, you know, do a recap and review, but I will say, um, like that was probably the weakest part for me. It has some of the trademark two thousand and you know early two thousands kind of stuff in there. Sometimes when it comes to the editing, um, and a lot I, of flash cuts, a lot of that like you know what I mean like the hyperactive yeah editing, hyperlapse like, hyperlapse stuff and yes. and um, I I don't necessarily dig the collar, but I understand the collar. <laughs> Uh, I understand Punisher's collar, his his uh, bulletproof collar. It makes a lot oh, of I sense guess to I'm have real, that. I, like, I, I don't know why, but I loved his look here. The faded skull, everything. I, I like the, cool. the the lack of pronounced skull. You know, he wasn't about branding like Thomas Jane, where he sets a whole car lot on fire to make a fiery uh, <laughs> skull there. Um, the, I thought the action was cartoonish, and I thought that the villain was cartoonish, but just the right amount of cartoonish for a comic book film. Um, I find Batman has a whole host of these kind of characters. And I felt like there was definitely some elements of Batman in this and we'll talk about it. But um, Batman has a whole host of just like slightly annoying mobsters. You know, they're not ever going to take over the world. They just want to run the fish racket or something like that. This was literally (laughs) on par with the penguin in the Batman. Yeah, and that's this is just that's a Colin Farrell fine. penguin. 
when you're watching movies about like the multiverse collapsing on itself or you know like that's where we've been getting fed a lot you know um universes being destroyed all that kind of stuff sometimes you just want to see a kind of a simpler story uh told here and i think that they were able to do that i actually do like um the actor who played jigsaw um uh cena and nathan fillion's love child dominic west dominic west i you know one of the other things that i want to say is like it just like further reminded me about how little scarring our billy russo had in the mcu when he got his face rubbed up on all that glass like he had like some he had like a cut on his upper cheek and maybe like a line well, here because in that one burnt all what pushed his face into a mirror and just slid him down yeah this is Homie this. here yeah <laughs> this was this was this was some rough stuff and I, I liked how all of that was practical i thought it looked well and again not even i wouldn't jump to the conclusion and be like well it looked well because it looked realistic it looked well because it looked like a comic book in my in my mind um and you could do worse than looking like a comic book in a comic book film so i want to give props to lexi alexander because she sounds like she fought for a lot of the stuff um, you know, she fought hard and I actually knew of Lexi's struggles and, uh, her, um, like the creative stuff that was going on with this because she was interviewed by Kevin Smith on Ke- Fat Man on Batman in one of the earlier episodes. And he basically brought her on as a director to director, like tell your story about this film. And she speaks about like putting Steve Stevenson through Marine training, like actually actual Marine training. And she speaks to not wanting to be too sensitive, you know, um, too reckless with the sensitivity when it comes to gun violence and, and, and et cetera and so forth. Sounds Thus like making, someone with passion. It sounds like someone yeah. with legit real passion. Yeah. I don't know if she ever did a film after this. Um, but yeah, I, I, so I wanted I to give props. Her. I wanted to give props to her because um, they don't give a lot of women films like this uh she's a german film director and former world kickboxing champion jesus so, christ what so, <laughs> okay so, there you go she did green streets i don't know what that is i know green streets yeah yeah i know Any that good? movie i haven't seen it but i know i know i, I know the title i know it by a multiple youtube movie film bro stuff she directed an episode of arrow she directed an episode of supergirl that would have been smith uh you know tapping you know putting her in and and, uh helping her out in those roles because smith is very tight with those with those people there she did stunt work on batman and robin um and yeah i just remember her really talking about trying to get this film across the finish line and just all the red tape and stuff and you could imagine with it also not being under the main brand marvel like you could imagine all the weird kind of um i mean you don't even get the standard marvel studios comic booky flip of that time you get what you get marvel knights what my background is over here like this is the only film with that <laughs> and considering that the mc way. would start now there is no to my knowledge there's no other film with it there's, they didn't do it with ghost rider electra what i'm trying to say dan is this is the dark universe logo review of logo oh reviews my God. this is the this is the dark universe on the mummy of logo yeah, review. yeah so i was like hey guys guess what we're branding a whole new, nope in two uh-huh. more months here comes iron man yeah we're not going to but let's get into this film. Uh, first thing I have here is opening credits. And I wrote that because it's been quite a while since I've seen a film with opening credits. Not only opening credits, but like not really trying to distract you with other stuff, opening credits. Like here are the, here's everybody in this film. Um, I, it I, It's so crazy how far we've come, right? Like we're now, the only way to get us to watch these same credits is like with animation and cool 3D <laughs> graphics in the background and the promise that we might get a, a, a little scene if we sit through and, and read all the names. Um, but I forgot when a movie would just have two minutes of just credits up front. Well, thank like, God for the Black Widow movie on that because they had one of the best opening credit sequences I've ever seen in a film next to yeah. Snatch. They found a way to keep you distracted and interested throughout it. And you know, like I remember they do the same something similar in the Hulk, is it right? Where they're going through schematics yes, they of 
Uh, mm-hmm. And his, they go into like flashback footage and his schematics at the same time. Um, but this is just like names is just coming up. But uh, here's I dig some it. stuff. Yep. Here's Ray Stevenson. Here's Dominic West. Here's some footage. Our story starts off with a pair of cops staking out the Magia, which is like the fake mafia in Marvel. That's what they called. Um, uh, they, they're staking out a, a dinner consisting of the most dangerous crime family in uh, New York. This is supposed to be New York, right? They never. I feel like they don't say New York a lot in this. It feels more like upstate, like a Yonkers. It, there's train stations and stuff, you know? Like there's like 40 sec- They made up train. I don't think there are actually any other train stations that are actually in our home of homes but um i i thought that i I dug that you know i always dig that um we see them pile into a fancy manner and we're introduced to billy the butte uh risotti uh you know billy russo if you will the highest earner of the family uh dominic west one of the cops seems super excited by the prospect that quote unquote he will show up so that they could bring him in the other cop seems doubtful Billy meets with his boss, who is his uncle, and discusses with him that another criminal named Cristo Bulat is bringing in some illegal biological weapon of sorts, but for helping him bring it in, the family makes 10 mil. The uncle says it's not worth it because he believes that Cristo is going to be selling these items to terrorists, and tensions run high, but things are settled in time for dinner. Outside, men are being systematically dismantled by a shadowy figure, and when the mobsters sit for dinner, they are shocked when the power cuts out. A flare is lit by the man behind this madness. The one man war on crime himself, Frank Castle, a.k.a. The Punisher. Which is truly, to me, one of the best frames in just film. Like that yeah, I think it's incredible. black and then psh, the red. Yeah. Um, I gotta, I gotta double check. And if Yogi's listening to this, he's probably yelling at me. But the I I had to... Uh, you know, moments with this film. The first moment was uh, with this moment. I was like, oh, fucking badass moment. Second one was, where have I seen this before? I think there's a similar scene in Batman Year One, I I think, where there's a dinner and then there's there a is, fire. There is. And I then can Batman confirm it. shows up yes. on the table and says something like, you guys have eaten too well for too long or something like that. <laughs> Um, no, one hundred percent. Yes, I can. Which, I, I've. I know. I've seen Batman with in a bl- in blackness with a flare at a dinner t- sequence and a it's like a fire before. behind him, and he's like just. It's a bunch of rich people around him, and but I, I I dig it in this scene. Like if any, like I think that this works here in this scene. It totally does. Um, it's also so ridiculous. Like no one heard this man step on the table. But again, this is what sets up the the level of realism in this film yep I it's even in the movie yeah i have absolutely no problem with people playing with realism in the film but you have to dictate you have to show me at some point what the rules of this universe are and the rules of this universe right now are frank castle can get in and out of anywhere without being heard or seen and no one could do a damn thing about it and i don't mind that at all because in, that's how it is in the comics for the most part you know like i just have to bring right this up because this is hilarious Ladies and gentlemen, you have eaten well. You have eaten Gotham's wealth, its spirit. Your feast, your feast is nearly over. Yeah. From this moment on, none of you are safe. And then puts out the fire. Yeah, but Frank Castle ain't say shit. He just starts massacring nope, just everybody does. around him. And I'm not gonna lie, it will for it, Rick and Morty has forever tainted me because that's just the Purge episode. Yeah, and they probably got it from this as well. You know. It feels good. And so he just starts killing it. And he just starts killing everybody. Dude's um, hanging from the chandelier, just gunning people. Again, ridiculous. <laughs> Keeps the momentum. Keeps spinning. Ridiculous. But again, they set the they set the standard and I, I'm down with this. Everyone's getting shot and they're making noises. The the the, the bodies are being impacted by the bullets. There's a I like how the action scenes were shot in this. I'm watching this for every corner, every screw because I, I know I'm not going to be wowed by the story in the terms of being surprised by the story. I've 
seen enough Punisher stuff and of read course, enough Punisher this stuff. Isn't any, this to isn't get supposed that. to be anything groundbreaking. You're just right. supposed to crack up at the fact that this man just cut the head off of a guy in a wheelchair and then cracks the neck of a chick trying to grab a gun in. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, he just breaks it woman's neck. Women um <laughs> He massacres his whole family without mercy, killing men and women alike, cutting throats, shooting off limbs, breaking necks. Uh, Billy and his crew manage to get away, and one of the cops manages to catch Frank red-handed, but decides to help him get Russo uh, instead, faking a confrontation between the two. Uh, uh, Safioti is, a, is the name of that cop. And I don't know where he goes after this. <laughs> for, the rest of the, uh, for the rest of this, we deal with Agent Soap who was his partner in the beginning of this, and he ends up teaming up with the FBI guy, which we'll talk about in a bit, but I don't remember where this character ends up uh, going. Billy tries to hide at his bottling plant, but Frank is in pursuit. After using a pencil to fix the break in his nose, uh, he witnesses some parkour guys. Again, both of these scenes equally ridiculous. <laughs> both the, I, the I will forever thing. love the fact that he put the pencil by his nose and resets the bridge that way. Like, who does that? And then who right after that, that, and then right after that, these these guys decide to just parkour into the scene. <laughs> I'm just like again, very two thousands. But and I think it's kind of funny because. He was, I, I was even, I wrote this down in my notes. Did he break his nose? Because after the whole uh, family massacre thing, he's just walking through the mansion, just going. <sighs> yeah. I'm like, yo, why is he breathing so yeah, heavy out of his nose? And I thought they were doing like a John Wick thing when he picks up the pencil. Like, oh, you know, I'm not even going to use any of my guns. I'm going to use this pencil. No, but he did stab a dude with a magazine and then load the gun with the same magazine and gun him down. Yeah, that was pretty. This impressive. man is sick. That was pretty impressive. Um, so, uh, yeah, he sees those, uh, uh, parkour guys making their way into the bottling plant too. Turns out Billy hired these lunatics to help make sure everything goes well at the docks. Using his skills, Frank gets inside the plant and shoots someone he suspects to be one of Billy's men, but it's an undercover agent. I had to watch this scene twice. I can't believe it's the first person. <laughs> like, literally the first, the first person he shoots is the wrong person. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I thought that was I thought that was pretty funny. Um, it yeah, it's an undercover agent. The shot alerts Billy to his presence, and after a confrontation, Frank tosses Billy into the bottle crushing machine and leaves him for dead. Thought that that entire scene was well done, well shot, well acted by Billy, who increasingly panics when he realizes where where he is and what's happening and what's going to happen. And I like that I like that Punisher just left him there. I think that was an incredibly punisher thing to do. Obviously, you should make sure the body is disposed of. But always thought, double tap. I think he 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 thought that he was good here. I mean, any any sane person would be like, "Yeah, you're not surviving a bottle crusher." Ah, right. Um. So the FBI shows up while Frank escapes to his underground bunker and armory, visibly angry after accidentally killing an officer. It's this scene and another scene where I think he's like running down the street where I'm like, oh yeah, Frank can't fly. He has no gadgets to like <laughs> for fast travel. He has a Punisher van, but he doesn't have it in this. There's a lot of times where he's just like walking down the street fully armored. Like he's got his guns to his, his waist and stuff like that. He's just running down. No, that, was one of my, that was one of the funniest things that they did in the Daredevil, in Daredevil season two, where it's like, this man is just wanted by the police walking down the street with duffel bags of guns. <laughs> How does this work? In what sense? Yeah, right. I, um, but yeah, it, it's just Frank. So again, th th these criticisms, none of these ruined the film for me. Um, I just thought they were no, it makes it kind of it just makes it ironic with the yeah. character. Yeah, I, it's irony in that world. That's that's all it is. Um, so uh, yeah, he bounces. He oversees. Okay, so yeah, so he gets his bunker. He throws something because he's like tight that he killed this officer. I thought that this plot point was actually extremely nuanced because it shows. That in the midst of the literal mist of blood that Frank goes on, you know, this crusade, his, his one-man war against crime, that he does have a line. 
you know that he does not want to just kill like oh it's not there's no he's never killed anybody innocent and that's what makes him not a murderer in a real sense but the idea of innocent i feel like is in the eye of the beholder right the eye of the idea of guilty and how guilty you know like you know your friend sells drugs are you an accomplice to that you're guilty a, I should mean, you be a, shot <laughs> by the eyes by the eyes of the law if i know you sell narcotics yeah right. i'm an accessory after the fact so you understand what i'm saying so it gets it can get kind of hairy and it but it shows that there is a, a, a almost definitive a more definitive line than we would have thought you know in the hazy view of good and bad he at least believes that officers men on a mission men of men in uniform at the very least he doesn't want to he doesn't want to kill there's a line there <laughs> Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. Then he goes to the funeral of the uh, agent, Agent Donatelli, and realizes that that man left behind a wife and daughter. We find out that Donatelli, like I said, he was under he was an undercover agent, so he was he managed to find out that this crystal shipment is coming in and something. It's going to end up being something so big that they need Homeland Security to deal with it. So his colleagues are like, okay, we have to figure out what's, what's going on here then. Frank goes to his family's grave site, and we are shown a flashback of him at the picnic holding his loved ones who are covered in blood. Classic Frank Castle. Flashback, classic Batman, put, you know, uh, pearls uh, kind of stuff. Here's something I, like I want to ask. Better here, I did like it better yeah. here because it it did more of the comic booky sense of, you know, his family was literally in Central Park and they got gunned down in well, what what was it like, it was like stray bullets or whatever, like in the, just random civilians just in the crossfire. That's the word I'm looking for. Crossfires. I like it more better than his entire literally his entire family killed in a family reunion in Puerto Rico. Like, that's messed up. Like, there's one thing with, you know, like, yeah, you're going to kill his kids, his wife and kids, but that man had nobody after that one in 04. Yeah, right. I, um, I really like also, I like his voice for Frank. You know, he's a Northern Ireland man. So, you know, you can do all kinds of voices. I'm not, I'm not 100% sold on the greaser hair and slick back. You know, because I'm not afraid high. of the slick back hair. But but it changes, right? Because we've seen high and tights, we've seen slick backs. There's all kinds of. Well, how do you like your Punisher hair? If I had to be truly honest, I I do love the burnt all hair. Yeah. I I, uh, I the think high and tight. I think the high and tight really sells the character. But from every comic book drawing, at least that I've seen of Castle, Ray Stevenson is literally pulled from the pages. No one's ever done the white boots and gloves. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they don't. Where the, where the, where the machine pouches are like the, the Punisher teeth on Wait, the, on he, the. Have none of us seen the Dolph Lundgren Punisher? I don't think, don't tell me he puts on the white suits. He doesn't put on the white suits and gloves and that, does he? I think he I just has a, I think of what I've seen. I know he has the utility belt. I think he just has like the duster, doesn't he? I think he does have the duster. I could have sworn he had the utility belt or whatever that's supposed to be. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check, but in the meantime, another question I had to ask you over preference is, um, no, I don't even see the skull, bro. It's just a T. Yeah, he's just rocking a T-shirt, a duster, and gloves. He doesn't even have the skull. Oh, thank, thank God. Thank God and, for that. Okay, sorry. He has, uh, now in a new image, I see he has one, like, a skull on the chest of the duster. <laughs> so, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's on the he chest. Ruined of the, the duster. duster? Ruined the duster. At one point, or maybe it's just like a leathered coat. But um, yeah, another question about preference. How do you like your Frank Castle origin shown? Do you like it? I, I, and this can be brought up with Spider Man and even Batman on occasion, right? Do you like um the in real time chronologically seeing that before you see? the hero no or do you like to see the hero up, no. burst and then eventually be told how I, they got I, there whatever way at, at this point in the game the, okay for certain comic book characters for the, the most obscure that you can think of we need origins guardians needs an origin iron man needs an origin captain america needs an origin spider-man batman 
Superman. Hell, the Incredible Hulk does not need an origin. And I am so glad that with this movie, they gave us an already established, already feared, on-the-run Punisher. And for something that I guess you can consider not even, I guess, not even a soft reboot, just a Punisher movie. It's the most, I can call it, the way I look at it is it's, it's a harmless movie. But I love my Punisher this way. I love an established Punisher that gets his flashbacks. It's the same way with Burntall. It's the same way with Burntall. I loved with Frank Castle just being thrown into this world. And we have to put the pieces together with Karen. And we and we follow her. Yeah. And then you get some flashbacks, you know. Because the, 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 the more popular Punisher film does it chronologically. We actually see him as a cop. You know, and then if this was a massacre MCU, happens, we would literally and then, get the entire thing. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that works better to make him feel vindicated? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to, like, it's the same way with Batman with with what justifies his actions. If you want to be able to justify the Punisher, you have to have something like the two thousand and four Punisher. Where yeah. now you you know you're now you're you're not only rooting for him but you're rooting for the bad guys to go down, yeah. And but with, with this, what it comes down to for me is it confidence. When you get a superhero movie that's already lived in, like Man of Steel, yeah. like the Batman that came out last year, mm-hmm. confidence. That's what they exude. They trust their audience to know this character so well that they don't need to handhold even the newest of people in that makes sense and this movie didn't hold no one's hand no no it's spartan kicked you right in that's it i think at this point 2008 if you're watching anything called the punisher you kind of understand what that this is a mad a revenge film you know and not like we were um we're lacking for those in the era of Kill Bill around this time, right? So I think people kind of got what it was with this. Uh, Buddy Ensky, I got to find this actor, man. I, I think it's um, Buddy Ensky, Buddy Ensky, Buddy Ensky, Buddy Ensky. Why can't I find it? I think, oh, Colin Sa- Sa- Salmon. Colin Salmon. Colin Salmon. Uh, okay, uh, okay. Colin, Colin Salmon. Salmon. So Colin Salmon was in this. He was also in Arrow. He's the person who marries Moira after the father dies and who Ollie gives shit to. Walter. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. And you know, I actually didn't like him when I first saw Arrow because it's like, bro, aren't you supposed to be, you know, Mr. Like his business like, best partner. friend? Yeah, like his, yeah, like, you're like his best that. friend. Yeah. You married yeah. his wife. And and he, and, and um, what's his face is giving him a bunch of shit for it. Ollie's giving him a bunch of shit like at the dinner table for it. Like, yeah, I didn't know you would uh, sleep with my mom, Walter. You know, this <laughs> is like, oh my God. Um, but he also ended up um, playing a descendant of Zod's in Krypton. He was part of the main cast of Krypton for 18 episodes. Um, I bring that up because oh this, he has he has a, like a very commanding like stance and voice. I feel like this cop does, um, and they give him like a whole. I'm even with Frank Punisher scene in this later on where I'm like, what? <laughs> what? But yeah, uh, I just want to bring that up. Mr. Colin Salmon, I think did a well, uh, a good job playing uh, Buddy Ensky, um, who is Donatelli's old partner who shows up to the NYPD trying to help him with the, this terror threat because he's the FBI. They put him in the Punisher task force with uh, Agent Soap as kind of a joke because it's in the basement and soap is kind of dopey have you did you get that in no. this yeah yeah he's it's it's supposed to be one of those like cohen brother tropes in my eyes where there's always a cop that's just an idiot so i thought that and then i realized that martin soap was one of the only uh characters in this that was blue on wikipedia 
So I clicked that. Martin Soap is a character created um, for the Punisher series. He is a cop that uh, is like sort of kind of an ally to the Punisher. The publication history of this character starts with the statement uh, that when he was born, he was dropped on his head. Jesus. So, so I don't know how much of this in- <laughs> informed <laughs> this betrayal in this, but I found it way too ironic to not bring up. Because <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> like literally, That's what the wow. hell? Did That's this guy just pick up a bunch wow. of comments? And say, oh yeah, my my actor actually <laughs> um was dropped on his head. Was dropped on his head. It literally says moments. This is fictional character biography. Moments after his birth, soap was dropped on his head by a nurse. He was then abandoned at an orphanage in Dunmore, New Jersey, where he remained from 1971 to 18. 19- I'm uh, sorry, 1987. So, Jesus yeah. Jesus Christ. He spent 18 years in an orphanage after being dropped on his head by an what is the What is the point of that detail unless you're trying to say Why did they give him this? up? <laughs> Why did they even give him up? Yeah, so, this, so uh, Dash, Dash, <laughs> Mihook plays him. Um, he was, he's done, he's known for being in Ray Donovan. But that's who plays Martin Soap. Dash meat hook. Yep. <laughs> yep. M I H O K. M I H O K. Me hook. Yeah. Dash. Either meat either Mike. No, I'm not even gonna say it. I'm not even gonna say it. It's too low hanging of fruit. Dash meat who, hook. Who the hell is this? Are, do you know who T J Storm is? No. Okay, I'm not like, this cast is very small to me. No, apparently this is man. He's again credited. Like anybody who's blue on this is surprising. He is a um, uh, half black, half Puerto Rican um, actor, stuntman, dancer, martial artist, best known for his motion capture performances in Tron Legacy, Captain America: Civil War, Deadpool, and Godzilla, and as Godzilla in the MonsterVerse series. Wait, no. I know who he is. I know who he is now. I'm trying to remember where exactly he, I he seen him. He bow caps as Godzilla. He is Godzilla in King of Monsters. He's Godzilla in Godzilla. Oh my God! Please don't say you're upcoming. Uh, upcoming. He's an upcoming. My grandpa, the assassin. <laughs> Knights of the Zodiac, Lost Odyssey, The Red Script, um, Under Wraps Two, Under Wraps Two. No, they're not. I remember. I remember Under Wraps one. But who oh that Under Wraps one would would be on the radar to watch Under Wraps two? Bro, you're talking about a movie from like that's the movie that kicked off the Disney Channel original movies. That movie's like 1997. The movie's like fucking 20. Oh my god! But that in Smart House, right? That and the Thirteenth Year, the kid that was ter- that turned into a mermaid on his thirteenth birthday. Oh yes. The, and the leprechaun thing, right? Luck of the Irish. You luck of um, the Irish. <laughs> um, it's um, he plays the leader of the urban free fro gang. Apparently, I've no. Oh, is he the? He's the parkour guy. Yes, yes, he is. Uh, okay, that's okay. where I remember the parkour from exact- guy is the is plays Godzilla. What a yes. weird, what a weird. Like, that is exactly resume. where I remember him from. He is the parkour guy. Like, I'm the parkour guy, but I also play Godzilla. Um, they find out that uh, this guy, Soap, has been spending five years catalog- cataloging all things Frank Castle. He explains that six years ago, Frank Castle, a special forces instructor, uh, takes his family to a picnic and they are killed after witnessing a mob execution. Since then, all he's done is take out one crime family after another. Frank's um, Frank heavily considers retiring from his mission after killing one of the quote-unquote good guys. But his armorer, Micro, played by Wayne Knight, does his best to make him reconsider. Did not expect Wayne Knight in this. Did not know he was in this. This was very weird to me. And in the entirety of what he does in this, he doesn't seem like a very good for no. the Punisher. <laughs> no, not it made at me all. love the little Dicky Way night that we got in, in um the Punisher series. Yeah, the little Dicky Way night that we got in that. 
can't remember that guy's name. Lieberwitz. Lieberman. Uh um shit. Micro. I keep saying Wayne Knight. <laughs> Micro. But yeah, I I don't know if I'm buying Wayne Knight as a as a drug pusher. Or a gun pusher. Gun runner. No, Wayne Knight is just nah. When it's weird. Yo, they're just trying to get me all messed up in this, bro. The guy who plays Micro in The Punisher is named Ebon Moss Backrack. Yo, come on. Stop. I don't said they, they just <laughs> tripping me up, bro. <laughs> Backrack, meat hook. What and the first thing, and the first thing of trivia of him on this Marvel Cinematic Universe wiki is Ebon Moss Backrack previously worked with Shoren Ag Dashlu in the in the lake house. This is just my life right now. But anyway, um, but no, Wayne Knight is definitely. I think the my favorite part about Wayne Knight being in this movie is the fact that that they did micro and i knew who micro yeah. was at this point of me seeing the movie were like two years been, two and a half years later you've been just getting like knee deep into the comics around this time right yes yeah because i would have met alex at this time b roke i would have met him so i would have been definitely starting to dip my toes into real reading of comics not just what i did as a kid so like yeah. i knew who micro was so like i was very excited that we were going this route i dig it and like I said, I wouldn't have known. I'm like, what the hell? It's like they introduced Stick and Electra. You know? Oh, God. Poor Thomas Stamp. Um, they introduced Stick and Electra, and like I at the time, I would have been like, who is that? And if that's all you're going to do with that character, I don't think I want him anymore. <laughs> but then you get the Stick played by the incomparable uh, other dude, um, Kevin Garvey Sr. Good, good old Scott Glenn. Scott Glenn. Um, you're going you change- crazy. Yeah, and it, and it changes your and it changes your whole thing. It changes your whole perspective on the character. So I'm glad that um, some of these characters I think work better in weekly installments. So you can build up. Well, no, and that's some what got me so excited because I'll never forget with um, I when I watched Punisher, I accidentally I had to go back because I was going. I went to my friend's house and he was already at literally the season finale of one. So the very first time I ever saw Burnt Dolls Punisher series was literally seeing Billy Russo's face being pushed into a mirror. And when I'm just seeing that scene unfold, I'm saying to myself, wait a minute. Am, is, this, is this guy Jigsaw? Is this guy oh, going to yeah. be like Jigsaw in season two? Holy crap. So it's like this movie got to introduce me to a lot of the stuff that I'm going to become to either have known recently, not too long, or in the future we'll know about the Punisher. Talk about personal choices what an odd choice to make billy like his friend in the show if this is yeah. majority of how this guy's been portrayed he's always a mobster who just falls into his quote-unquote bad acid and comes out you know transformed after the fact i kind of think like what you say with the nuance it does give burnt burnt all his that punisher a little bit of nuance where it's like damn i have to go after somebody that is basically the only sense of family i have left now that i don't have an actual family but similarly this one being a bit more cartoonish made it feel like he was a more of a threat in this universe to frank than the other russo was to yeah to, to that frank yeah because this was a legit like foil this was a foil unless you're frank. a woman that wants to get thrown out of a window then then, then, then. <laughs> <laughs> uh just remember like that was like a plot point in that second season of uh punisher but um we find out that russo is still alive although heavily disfigured we find out he finds out that donatelli was a rat and immediately sets his sights on donatelli's family once he realizes the feds have his money his doctor comes in and tries to explain that they did the best they could considering all of billy's bone structure tendons facial muscles and skin were ripped to shreds none of it was left over once unwrapped billy is furious about his heavily disfigured face and he kills his doctor before deciding on the name jigsaw what did you think you of this that from oh he was looking at a puzzle yeah some reason where he was at killing this man for some reason where he was at killing this man there was a bill electronic billboard showing a puzzle and he was just staring at it before if that's the case then jack nicholson's joker shouldn't even be joker jack nicholson's joker should be called the staircase because i walked up the stairs as i had my first kill 
But I get no, but he's a joke because his face, his smile, right? It's stuck. No, it's, yeah. So I think they were just trying to. To be fair, if this really did happen, I don't think that face looks that bad. Yeah, you know what it is? It, it's like a live action Chucky. It's, it's like if stitching. Chucky grew it's up. It's the stitching that makes it look the most horrifying. But if those elements were able to be smoothed out, I think given the nature of his accident, they did a pretty good job. Now they had to use horse hide in various locations, which probably didn't help. But I love that one bloodshot eye covered like in another piece of skin. <laughs> like I, I love the ca- the character design for this. I really, really did. I kind of wish, I'm not going to lie, I kind of wish we did have some staples. Like I yeah. wish we had some legit surgical staples. Like I, I really think scars and scars look better with staples. Like look at um Julian McMahon in Fantastic Four. Oh yeah. When he had that scar in the eye and then the metallic would just like cut come over looking like if he stapled his eye. Another thing is like I said competently made. It is exposited that they went to a free clinic because they didn't have money. So that's the reason why the first round of surgeries, you know, not not the cosmetic part, but the first round to keep him alive wouldn't have would have went as rudimentary as it went. And then he goes to try to get whatever hack job he did in the first place, like kind of fix. And this is the best case scenario for this. Um, So it's time to talk about Looney Bin Jim because uh, he releases his criminally. Yeah, he releases criminally insane and cannibalistic brother, Looney Bin Jim, a.k.a. James uh, Russodi, who eats a man alive in front of him. Now, initially, I had a problem with this scene, I will say, because it starts off in a quite cartoonish portrayal of an insane institution, complete with overly uh, malicious guards who eat your applesauce, and taunt you and screams in the background and stuff and while i was rounding my mind on this idea of not liking this cartoonish portrayal i realized that they're basically portraying arkham <laughs> which which is kind of that anyway well, you know, while like, you're describing all of that like what you were upset with about it it's like in my head i'm just replaying scenes of term of the terminator 2 yeah yeah, you're also right. They yeah. did the same with, thing. With old girl in her room, yeah. Still getting ready for the Licked apocalypse. on the cheek, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this has got to be a, a, an homage to that because you got to believe that Frank Castle is a bit of a Terminator in his own right. Um, but, yeah, I thought that it was going to be revealed that everyone was just being, like, mean to Looney Bin Jim. And he wasn't all that crazy. And Billy would be the only one to see him for... No, no, he's he eats people. <laughs> he eats people. About, yep. What did you think about Looney Bin Jim as a character? Um, I'm personally, I love unhinged psychopaths. I love psychopaths that revel in it. Like, there's nothing more than just a chemical imbalance in their brain that just compels them to do things like that. Like, 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 I don't want to sound insensitive, but yeah, I do, I don't care for PTSD psychopaths. Like, in real life, please get them help. They need the help they deserve. But in movies, it's like, come on, man. How many times can you use your trauma as an excuse to just masturbate on the street in public? Like, like I'm th- like I need I love the fact that Looney Bin Jim was just loony for no reason. And they built him up a lot. Yeah. yeah. Like they really built a, like like uh, his brother wanted to see him. Jigsaw wanted to see him. Jigsaw defends his honor, his name. Like they. Well, yeah, when the old man is like, I should have put you in the. You and your loony bin brother. I should have killed both of you, whatever. Like that. He's like, Are you talking about my brother? And then he got, yeah. We can see like, yeah, they built him up to be him. this, like, important character. And even though he's not really all that much of an important character, I think he was a. Not writing wise, I think he was a greatly performed character. I think almost every performance in this movie was, like, the direction was great with Alexi. She really directed this thing. He ultimately puts the battery in his back, right? Like that's what Looney Bin Jim yes, does. Yep, yep. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he kind of helps his brother see through the disfigurement and, and become the mob boss. Like he thinks like, that I he think can it looks great. I think it looks this is gonna terrify the guys. Like he's just yeah. 
which is a great brother. He's a great it's brother. Also, it's also around this time that I wonder again, because you know you got to think about audiences and sensitivity and stuff. Um, we're just always allowed to make cartoons out of the Italian mob, right? Like that's just uh, like one of those Italian permissible mob. <laughs> the Italian mob, Russians, Russia, Russia as a whole, and German military. Okay, I was just like, because I was thinking, I'm like, no one ever says that. I mean, because the mob is real or was real, you know, at some point, like there's proof hey, of these. As things far existing. as it goes, it's still, it's still to this day, people will tell you the mafia still has an influence in things you don't think they have an influence in. Yeah, they so just, but I, I would think that that would mean that they would do less of this stuff, but it's just never not a thing. But maybe it's one, one of those problems things, with you guys. They make it so cartoonish that maybe, maybe it's the mafia funding the fake portrayals of the mafia in movies so that they're like well it looks so cartoonish people can't think this thing is real do you, do you not think the guys from it's always sunny would not have been whacked by now for that episode <laughs> unless they were put there by the mafia you know what I'm saying? That's what, that's what... they literally came up and said listen either you will or you will do this episode because you might or might not get your legs yeah. broken <laughs> right <laughs> Right after my parentheses uh, says cartoonish with a question mark for this whole asylum scene, I have Frank stalks Donatelli's family in a not cool way. That's the sentence that proceeds there's, that. <laughs> no, there is, there is no reason for him to do as much intel on that widow and her daughter that he does. It felt strange to me. I don't know. It, it, it definitely felt a little bit weird. Because yeah, they were trying, they were building up to the final act. They were building up to what we're gonna. What to me personally, and I kind of forgot about this moment when I read when I watched it for a rewatch. But then I remembered how the ending was gonna go, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, they're really building up this exact like this has been something since what Batman and Ro not Batman and Ro Batman Forever. Yeah, like like I'm t I honestly and personally that's probably my only <laughs> problem right? with this movie. I have I am over the choose i'm over the your your best friend or the woman you love choice i am it, God I, we'll it. talk about we'll talk about that scene um frank <laughs> takes a huge a huge amount of his own money and brings it to donatella uh donatella's widow angela who puts a gun on him but doesn't kill him for murdering her husband lbj continues to hype up his disfigured brother they have a meeting with Crystal about the biological. Dad, you did not. You did that on purpose. What? LBJ. No, they they say that. Oh, I don't remember that. So when they're in the car, when they go to when they go to when they go to when he's like, I'm gonna go get my brother out of prison. One of them says, Looney Ben Jim, and he goes, His name is James, not Looney Ben Jim, not LBJ James. <laughs> okay, because I'm about to LBJ. Say, that's because that's that's Lyndon B. Johnson. No, hundred percent. Looney Ben Jib, LBJ. They get they coined it, but I'm gonna use it because it's easy. <laughs> um, so they have a meeting with Crystal about the biological weapon shipment, and they tell them they know he plans to sell it locally, so they demand more money. Uh, it basically goes down like that. They do kill a couple people, but you know. Um, meanwhile, Crack Frank eggs. Meanwhile, Frank decides against retirement when Micro explains that if Russo is indeed alive, he's going to go after uh, Angela and the baby next. Um, this is probably the closest thing this thing ever comes to comedy with with the moment that he's like, get the, get the two guns. And he's like, why is it? Just get them. Watch. Three, two, one. And then Frank walks back in out of retirement and asks for the two guns. I thought that was pretty humorous i yeah. didn't chuckle but i thought that was pretty humorous no yeah because it shows a relationship between those two and i'm i do like a nice relationship between characters but i also am wondering what what is uh micro getting out of all this right like he's the homeboy saying he's gonna stop doing it he's like no no Listen, i need you to if keep you looked this. like wayne knight if you looked like wayne knight this is the best thrill you're gonna get in your life what do you think about micro's buyback better plan of buying the guns off the streets to give to the Punisher. <laughs> I think I've heard better talking points in the Democratic Party. No, for honestly, there's no reason why that had to be so relevant for today. Oh, the buyback like, that uh, was gun thing. Buyback. The, once they started bringing back the buyback guns, I'm like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> so like yeah, 15 he... years later, and we're doing it now. 
he legit uh well there's always been like a weird like gun for money for gun kind of thing it just doesn't have the incentive that they think it does because i think people value their gun more than they do money on occasion um, i mean l- l- it, not that i value a gun more than money but i'll tell you straight up if i paid like nine hundred dollars for like a you know like a glock nine and you only want to give me two hundred dollars to buy it back that's not happening like yeah i have my playstation if someone asked me for it immediately to sell it for the same price that i got it for i don't think i'd, I'd do it no no just exactly to, just to have even, the money i made that choice even. i don't want the money i wanted this <laughs> for the money <laughs> yeah exactly i want to make a profit that's the whole thing is as long as i make a profit i don't mind what i sell i'll yeah. sell my phone right now if i can make like a, a turn at least a 500 dollars profit on the damn thing what did you think of carlos micros hispanic friend, vaguely hispanic friend i you know honestly it's it's a trope at this point <laughs> it's one it's just one of those tropes to just always have like a token and it's not a, i don't want to use the word token person of color because it's it's not just that they say latin just, kings in this don't they at one point they, they 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 do i think uh towards towards the the climax obviously when you have every gang in the city i think some was like supposed to be standing for bloods some was definitely some kind of hispanic crime. i know there was an all black one all asian one like triad yeah. like a triad, <laughs> the mafia, triad. Like, yeah. no there was like literally a gang for every culture you can think of in this movie that's funny. like they were, they were touching all bases that's how progressive they were they're like, you get a gang, you get a gang, you get a gang. What are you? I'm Polish. We'll give you a gang, too. That's it. Okay. Right. They did not show the Aryans, so that's good. Oh, thank God for that. Yep. Thank God. They're, for keeping their, they're keeping their hands clean. Um, so uh, Marco's friend, Car- Marco, Micro's friend, Carlos, takes uh, Frank to where he can find those parkour guys and squeeze them for some info on Russo. Jigsaw, Jigsaw does indeed go to Angela's house. Frank targets the meth monkeys. I think I'm allowed to say that because Russo called them a bunch of monkeys jumping around. And we were told that they are high on meth all the time while they do this parkour stuff. Well, as as, as long as they're, they're, you know, that the uh, eggshell color, I think it's okay. Yeah. I think we well, what, yeah. I think one of, the, one of them is a bit darker, but that's why it's a little bit. But anyway, the meth monkeys are trying to get away from robbing a convenience store after hitting a, the owner with a machete right in the middle of their head. Um, but yeah, he targets them both literally and figuratively as he shoots one with a rocket launcher mid mid uh, mid flip um shoots one in the head and then shoots the last one in both knees gets the information he needs out of them and then tosses them off the building to be impaled on like an awning down at the bottom like a gate uh he finds out that russo is going to angela's house which i just said and which micro kind of told him was going to happen <laughs> uh the cops get there in time to see the impaled man, and Budiansky apprehends a fleeing castle. They fight for quite a bit, and Frank gets handcuffed. I was very surprised that this guy held up as much as he did against Frank. I don't know if they no, ever alluded I mean, to him being like mm-hmm. special forces either, or why Frank didn't just eventually like do something a bit rougher than I get his code of honor, but like if this guy is now impeding. Many other instant people getting killed. Where is the no? Line? There's a way to do self defense without you know hurting somebody. You you can be able to you know escape, but I I guess in a, like the, it was he's not just some you know low level street cop. But did he you see a, when he grabbed him by his collar and shoved his head into the car window? Yeah, <laughs> that would have knocked was, out a normal man. <laughs> and he was like he just no sold it and got back up. Like, what is going on? <laughs> Frank Castle walks away for a second, looks at this man's badge, and in that time, the guy gets up and handcuffs him. And it's like, you're going to you're going to prison. Dead or alive, you're coming with me. You're coming with me. Uh, some officers try to save Angela and her daughter, but Jigsaw and his crew massacre them. Jigsaw then flips out when he realizes there's no actual money in the house. That and another... Is- a, f- a really messed up scene and one of the most and this was just when i was a kid when I, in my teens New that York. was one of the most suspenseful scenes that i legit ever saw where like they're being picked off one by one from the porch 
the back patio or whatever. Yeah, because like, you're rooting for like, them, and it, it's not looking good. And there's, you know, there's like young, like rookie cops that are just doing their job, female cops, and you're just like, you know, and there's this this wife and little girl that are just in this, like, you know, like two story suburban home, but they really did a good job of like picking the officers off one by one, where you're like, oh my god, can Frank just get there in time? Frank, get there. Frank, get there. Right. And they, they do a lot of attention to show that this is a very dangerous situation. And like I said, sometimes I think Russo is going full mafioso in this. Like the accent's gotten stronger. The the bravado's gotten a bit stronger. He's more, hey, oh, hey, we're just trying to find the money here. Kind Looks of like we got him's advantage over you guys. Oh, Dan. Yeah. Um, and then they just cut to a shot of LBJ shooting the heads off baby dolls that are arranged in, in the line for some reason. <laughs> Which in my head cannon is like, did he take all of those toys? Yeah, yeah. he lined them he lined them up. Again, cartoonish, but it, we we're we're supposed to be shown how off but the that's wall he is. So in my opinion, this is what makes the That's not the guy you go work. back. Yeah, that's not the guy you go back and go, Oh, he has to have a really sympathetic backstory. No, no. This is a guy where you just get to see him kill toys. <laughs> like for like joy. In, in a world of movies like, you know, The in Winter world. Soldier, it, it, yeah, when we get stuff like The Winter Soldier with, you know, government espionage and and Dark Knight with like, you know, systematic oppression and pol- and police uh, police state, I'm glad that we could just sit down and just watch these harmless movies that Good or bad, what you can take away from it is that they just try to be themselves without having to be anything crazy. One of my biggest appreciations for the Daredevil, not the mm-hmm. not the TV show, the movie, and I can call it a bad film. I might think it's a bad film, but what I think it serviced was it was a harmless film in a world of movies trying to be deeper than what it should be. Yeah. And this movie just... It all all this movie needed to be was gory, action packed, and having Frank Castle be a badass. And I think it checked off all the boxes of what, you know, your standard run of the mill, harmless comic book movie could and should be. I just wish he was a I know it's gonna sound weird as a criticism of the Frank Castle character, but I just wish he was a little bit less haunted. You're asking a lot for a man that lost his wife and kids. I get it, but I feel like John Wick is in a similar kind of thing, right? John Wick lost his wife to cancer, bro, and a dog. <laughs> well, no, the dog, no, the but, and you're right because with that he ended up getting a a, a sequel to the dog. He he got himself you know, like a nice little pit bull. You know, it's like I get it, but I guess you should you wouldn't be that triggered because you're your your wars every day kind of stuff. Like I don't no, think Batman he, nowadays right. gets triggered. I think he might think about it, it, might make him remember stuff. But we were getting stuff in that in that first four Batman series where like he would see a pearl and instantly like whoa, like oh, fall into God. the madness oh, of the let's, moment. Let's not talk stuff. about Batman forever. That's Batman. what I'm that, that's what I'm talking about. Like I don't there was times I felt like this happened with him, right? Where he's just like standing there and he's looking and it's oh, that's like my daughter kind of stuff. And it's like when they're going to, um Punisher arrives, kills Jigsaw's two henchmen, he saves Buddy Ensky and the family, and he brings them to his his bunker. And I'm already like, Oh Frank <laughs> It's not your family. <laughs> These people are not your family. It's, I feel like this, this is where the romantic moment would come where, you know, he's like looking over his gun or she's looking over his guns. And she's like, do you really, do you really have to Which, use these? I mean, I got, yeah. They didn't do I it. They didn't do it. But I was credit like, for that. golly. Yeah. Because that whole Rebecca Romain scene in 04 where she's literally trying to talk him out of killing the people that literally just killed this family three months prior. It's like, yo, you don't know this guy he even that you? punisher got a surrogate family faster than this one did because he used the the neighbors and all that to to chill with and then when they got got he got even madder and got at a old um saturday night but still fever. the fact that like they had like rebecca remain like literally like in that weird nose by nose close shot of her saying like you don't have to do this you don't have to do this i'm like yo you known this guy for like two days Chill yeah, out. Know, yeah, yeah. Uh, and stop like shacking up with these people that you don't know for very long. Um, so one thing I did like was at one point 
but but Yansky goes to uh, apprehend one of the one of Russo's guys, and he's saying something like, "You have the right to remain." And Frank just shoots him in the face, <laughs> and his face just explodes. And then the actor Colin Salmon just like screams out, "Damn it, Frank!" Like in a very funny way of like that was like a buddy cop moment where he's like trying to press this guy or go by the book and Frank just shoots him right in the face. Big ass hole in his face. So that was well done as well too. Frank is like, fuck them four or five moments. No, nope. Yeah, he's over it. Yeah, no more four or five moments over here. So, um, but Iansky, uh ends up arresting the rest of the like jigsaw and his men frank lets the daughter play with his daughter's stuff did you did that do anything for you did that no nah, because i i'll say it i remembered a lot of the climax of this movie and by this point i'm like can we just get to the, what we <laughs> all know we're here for we're here for the raid redemption frank castle style can we just get here that's right that's exactly what i thought when i saw them setting <laughs> setting this whole thing up it's literally raid redemption and I think they both either came out the same year or Raid Redemption might have came out a few years after. I want to say Raid Redemption is anywhere from 08 to 2012. Redemption is 2011. Yep, I knew it. Anywhere from 08 to 2012. Um, that was a hell of a four-year period. That's the exact four-year period I was in the military for. Um, okay, so back with our people's uh cancel sorry my computer's acting up um jigsaw now in police custody decides to flip on christo so long as he can get info on micro the 12 million dollars he was going to get from christo anyway for the shipment and immunity for him and his brother the police agree due to the severity of the threat of the biological weapons they do the sale christo is busted and promises revenge i was kind of surprised that but he turned so quick, but that was kind of smart because he got everything he wanted. Yeah. You know, he figured out what the real threat was, which was these biological weapons. And if he can get them off the street, you know, um, and yeah, he just basically fed them to the police. Which so he I get- kind of think is the funniest thing to me about criminals. Cause this is the same thing that was with, that was, the, um, uh, pro- uh, Aaron Johnson's name, Aaron Johnson's character. Uh, the character in uh, Homecoming where he didn't like Vulture's weapons on the street because he has a nephew and all that. It's like, it's so funny how sometimes where movies will pin it where it's one thing where a criminal will use a handgun, but once you start throwing ray guns, yeah, yeah, like once you start throwing ray guns into into the mix, they're like, well, hold on a minute. You know, I'm just, I'm not all about that. It's like, it's, it's escalation, and comics are great at showing escalation by comparison. Again, you know, you have uh, Joker, you know, where he flips out on Red Skull, where he's like, I'm I'm a maniac, but I'm not a, like, genocidal maniac. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, or Hitler. I'm a racist. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> May shoot babies, but I'm not a racist. Um, and he's also afraid of the IRS. I mean, who wouldn't be? They got Al Capone, bro. <laughs> so the Russo brothers kidnap Micro after murdering his mother. <laughs> Don't say it like that. <laughs> that that's what they are. That's, they are, the, are they not the Russo brothers? They are the Russo brothers. Um, the Russo brothers kidnap Micro after murdering his mother, and when he goes missing, Frank leaves to investigate, leaving Carlos with the woman and her child. They end up being sitting ducks because they get kidnapped after Carlos is shot. Frank then euthanizes Carlos. What did you think about that? What do you think about? <laughs> I, uh, Don't let me go like this, Frank. Frank says, you're going to make it out of this. And the guy's like, I don't know. And then he's like, you can't let me stay like this. And Frank's like, all right. And then he shoots him. Frank didn't like try to cover the wound or run to go get any. <laughs> he kind of like figured it out that he was kind of bullshit. I was like, listen, we got about 20 minutes left of this movie. Like either you're going to come with us or you're going. Like, and Yo, I'm not dragging going? you. All right. Yeah, yeah, you can't I'm walk. Not I'm not dragging you. So It kind of reminded me of Wixler's uh, fake out death in the first uh, blade. My, oh, because it went to black. Give me my damn gun. Now walk away, you son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Christopherson. Um, 
Yeah. That is Chris, that's Chris Christopherson, right? That's yeah. not, um, who's the, oh, I always confuse him with freaking, uh, Eric, Hol, uh, Eric Nolte. Yeah. Nick Nolte. Nick, yeah, was, I always, Nick Nolte is on in Hulk. I always confuse Nick Nolte and Chris Christopherson. And for some strange reason, sometimes Nick Nolte and, uh, Sam Elliott. But that's when I was younger, before I was, I knew about the mustache. What did you think about Frank Castle saying he wants to sh- shoot a fair one with God? Yeah, it's kind of funny because he, I never really pictured Frank Castle as a, as a Christian man, or at least a Christian that lost his way. Like, yeah. it, didn't the comics like pin it where like Frank Castle was like a Catholic, but like stopped believing in God because of the the kids thing or maybe that was just a, a I mean it's it's thing. it's quite hard to believe that somebody who would believe that God is the overall chooser of life and death that you would you know that you would be the the judge jury and executioner in that sense right well i mean he does come become the cosmic ghost rider so it's like at that point oh yeah maybe right. he is god's favorite but i do i, I do like a, i do like myself a religious not religious, but like a, a Catholic, a, th- that Catholic guilt ever since Daredevil, the show, there's something about that Catholic guilt that just feels great where it's like, you know, what you're doing is wrong, but it's like, you have to do this. And there's something in you that tells you this can only be done by me. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, uh, duty, right. You have and a sometimes, duty. you know, like Job, you don't get to, to choose your duty. You know what Matt thought of Job, bro? Matt is Job. Thinking, Matt I, I is Job. I know, but I always just think of that line. <laughs> he says that about Job when he was over it. But I thought this was kind of I, I, I got Gotham Knights esque moment where he's in the church, right, talking to the priest, and then he ends up ends up talking to Budiansky, and he's like, "Okay, I'll do the trade because obviously Jigsaw wants me in exchange for the hostages, so I'll go, but I need you to help me do the trade." So in the meantime, Billy amasses an army by promising the disenfranchised gangs of New York high pay and no punisher to deal with so long as they work alongside him. The irony of this entire scene and the scene that leads up to it is that he says he's going to get an army the way the actual army does by just lying and promising a bunch of money that they'll never see because they'll never live long enough to do it. And then he goes and gives a speech and a American flag waves in the background. He basically was a recruiter. Uh, for like a army recruiter for that uh, scene, um, which I thought was pretty clever on, on the nose, but it worked. Um, Budiansky and Soap convince Christo's father to target Jigsaw to complicate things, while Jigsaw's new army creates a heavily armed uh, stronghold as the gangster's new headquarters out of the Brad Street Hotel. Christo's dad shows up with his gang and Billy's men have a shootout that allows Frank to enter through the second floor window undetected. The one man army shoots his way through several waves of men. His biggest challenge being the unpredictable Looney Ben Jim. He manages to get into the same room with Jigsaw and the hostages after a scuffle with Jim and is disarmed. Jigsaw shoots Castle a few times before making him choose between the two sets of hostages. Is what you were talking about the Jews. Yeah. First of all, I, are they being I, held by velvet rope? Is that what that is? That what that is? Yes, yes, that okay. is. Okay, I thought it was a strange uh, choice, but yeah, velvet rope. I, I, I remember, I'll never forget. This was the first time where I'm like, damn, we didn't give Wayne Knight enough, you know, credit as an actor. He did a really good job as a man that was accepting his death, that knew what it was, and it's like. I have to sacrifice so that. But this death is his fault, right? The death is one hundred percent his fault. That no one's taking (laughs) that shit. But but also, I remember getting mad when I first saw it too. What he does to get out of this, I felt like he could have done it smarter and kept both alive. He probably could have done that. There's, there's probably a way. Because basically, Looney Ben Jim has his gun trained on the people on the on the. On the um, the wife and the and the daughter, and then um, Jigsaw has his gun pointed at Micro, and he's telling Frank to shoot Micro. So Micro Frank is trained on Micro, but 
Frank instead shoots Looney Bin Jim, and then out of anger, <laughs> Russo then shoots Micro, and then um, then I think yeah, that's about it. But it just seemed like if you had one shot, you probably could have shot Russo. Still shot Looney Bin Jim. I don't know how. Oh, he only said one bullet was left, right? I just felt like yeah. <laughs> just felt like Frank could have found a better way to get out of that instead of literally falling into the trap of the villain and having to choose, you know. But it's whatever. Frank, uh, oh yeah, he tried. Then he tried. Then uh, Jigsaw tries to shoot the innocent people, and Frank jumps in the way of the bullets, like literally. Uh, Frank stabs Jigsaw and then throws him onto a fire to be burned alive. <laughs> Again, a bit cartoonish, but exactly what the what the the uh, character deserved. Outside, Angela forgives Castle, who bids farewell to Budiansky and the Donatelli family. As Castle and Soap leave together, Soap tries to convince Castle to give up on his vigilante status after uh, having "quote unquote" killed every criminal in town. Soap changes his mind when he's held up by a murderous mugger, who quickly becomes another victim of the Punisher. Boom, boom, boom. I did um, like the Jesus save. I did like the weird Jesus saves. And then Jesus goes around and saves goes out. And then you hear the gunshot. And then Soap says something like, now I got brains all over me. So that know. has been it. George, you have finally, after all these years, after all yeah. my begging, after all of, it took, it took a poor man's soul to reach the ultimate after. A rainbow ring, bridge. Okay? It, it it took the rainbow. He went to bro. Valhalla. <laughs> he literally and, did. He went to Valhalla, bro. And now, now for me, from my own end, I need to know. I know you said you thought it was great, and we've had our we had our discussion. But I need to know as far as initial once the credits hit, what did you think? I like I said, I I appreciated that it kind of sort of gave us the rules of the universe the kind of tone that this was there was never a tonal clash for me where i feel like a lot of this stuff in the 2000s that wasn't done by the mcu was right like with fan four stick and stuff like that trying to have his cake and eat it too you know be um there was no because there was no blueprint yet no but this obviously has a blueprint of action films right um i like percent um, yes I like the act, the the um, actors that were chosen and um, some of the characterizations. Wouldn't have shoot him up came out the same year. This feels like shoot him up. I, that's the first thing I thought about when he's swinging around in the balcony. That's exactly what I thought too. This is I'm shoot thinking, him up. Yeah, I'm thinking shoot him up. But if there's anybody you could do a character like that with, is Frank or Wade. You know, I feel like you can do that kind of stuff. And I feel like while they they were able to do a lot of this inventive stuff with Wade. It just they just made a joke out of it because that's what that character is for, but in this I feel like it's it's uh, it's a bit more. Um, I really did like this. I I think this might be a more enjoyable watch than the 2004 Punisher film, but I still have a bit of recency bias, so maybe I have to go check out the 2004 one and see uh, how it still stands up. But this I would say like that I have quicker, recently watched easy, it. Yeah. Not too long ago, a couple of months back, but I did recently watch it because I think it ended up on some kind of streaming service. And I'm like, okay, I gotta, I, I haven't seen this in forever. I think we covered it when we covered I think we did. You've definitely covered 2004 Punisher for some reason. Maybe for which was worse, but I don't know if we've covered it for. Well, maybe we just talked that. about it. No, we, I think we did do. A, no, we definitely haven't put it on a which was worse. Because we wanted to save, I wanted to save any which was worse from not having any of those movies because I don't think they were bad. But maybe we talked about it just in general as you know, like off air. But I remember talking about this movie, and I having having rewatched it. It what it is is it's like this. It's one of those harmless movies. It's like a you know, it's not trying to be anything. It's not trying to be deep. But there is a there's a good twenty minutes of this movie that's genuinely boring. Like the chase scene mm -hmm. with the fake Johnny Cash. Yeah, that one, that scene, that, that, you could have taken that entire scene out. That felt like a. Like I said, game. I feel like in this movie, every ten minutes, someone's getting shot in the face. For bad oh, or for yeah. good, there's something interesting happening every ten minutes in this movie. Something ridiculous, something that make you you know laugh or bug out or you know. Just keep you entertained. And sometimes I think we forget about that. Um, 
I think there's room for both these films and the more serious stuff. The you know, obviously, uh, if you've listened to this podcast before, you know I I I prefer to watch things that make me feel something, and this didn't really necessarily make me feel anything, but I thought it was a spectacle worth watching. And um, the worst parts of this that you can consider the worst parts of this are a symptom of the times and the genre. Uh, it hadn't been things hadn't been broken yet, so we could see where these things could really go. And I I want to give Lexi Alexander another bite at the apple. I hope that she is able to um, work in the future on another comic book project because I do think that this has an eye to it. Um, and again, competent. I was never lost. I never did not know where the characters were or where they were going or where people got money from or who's related to who. All of that very clearly laid out. Um, so... I appreciated that and I appreciated this movie. So I'm thankful to have watched it. I'm thankful to have you on uh, to talk about it. Of course, I'm I am 100% glad that we're finally that we finally have tackled this movie. This has been a long time coming and genuinely listen, it's 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 no civil war. It's no infinity war. But I would throw this up as one of Marvel's strongest standalone films. Yeah. It's definitely, in a sense, it's one hundred percent better than than the uh, the Fantastic Fours, the uh, Daredevils, Elektra, Ghost Rider. It's I don't know one hundred percent about better, but it's definitely got something that those films don't have, and maybe it's an understanding of what it's supposed to be, which sometimes is enough. Well, I, my I think my issue with uh, specifically the Daredevil and the Electra is it's not that they didn't know what they were. It's I think they were too overconfident of what they were trying to be, and it turned into the that joke, you know, motor, motorcycle fetish, leather mm-hmm. fetish, or whatever. Like it, Daredevil was way too dark and brooding, where it's almost like watching Adam West's Batman in the two thousands. Yeah. But I think that those you I I can't help but believe that that name, that IP of Batman gets thrown around in every studio comic book movie, you know, every comic book movie studio discussion forever at all times. You know, I you got to believe that. And I could totally have seen in 2003 Fox being like, this could be our Batman. And then I could totally see. You know, Lionsgate in 2008 being like, this could be our Batman. You know, the Batman of um, of uh, Frank Castle. Like, how do we do Batman but with guns? <laughs> it was a pleasure, even though that's exactly what he doesn't want to mess with, right? It was a pleasure to um, to have this discussion about this film. But to be honest, it sounds like in the future, you'll be having many discussions about many films. Uh considering that this will be released on Wednesday, is there anything you'd like to tell the people about something you might be cooking up over there on your side of the things? Well, everybody in comic book land, uh, if you would like to, the, the door will always be open to, there is no such thing as a door. It's just a, a hole over here in the wall, like Toontown. If you've ever mm-hmm. seen who framed Roger rabbit, which will be the things I will be discussing on my very own podcast coming soon called two guys and a couch at, and it's just an all over film podcast. There's just going to be a podcast about some of the best films of this year, last year, 20 years ago, some of my favorite films. I would even love to hear about, you know, viewers' favorite films. Then where you can find me for now is all man underscore it's Dan on TTV on Instagram. And I hope to see all of you and hear all of you soon for the Sofa Bros podcast. It's coming, man. It's coming. Uh, you've got enough podcast experience underneath your belt and that whole uh, Rolodex of a mind when it comes to cinema. It's going to be an interesting adventure to see uh, how you guys tackle some of the latest, greatest things to come to movies and cinema in general. But we'll continue to do what we do here each and every Wednesday, which is try to cover the latest and greatest things to come to comic books and comic book media. And we do all that at comicbookclick.com, the one-stop shop for everything comic book click. Articles written by us, merchandise that we sell. It's the quickest way to get to our Patreon, quickest way to get get to our T Public shop. Both ways you can help support us monetarily. Uh, If you have that money, if you don't, consider rating, reviewing us on iTunes, the Major Issues Podcast, which is available on everywhere a podcast is available. Podcast, um, Addict, Stitcher, Podbean. 
the Apple Podcast app, the Google Podcast app, um, SoundCloud, I think, possibly YouTube, but it's definitely on Facebook. Look around, people. But the quickest way is to Google the Major Issues Podcast, and it will be the first result to come right up. I'm quite proud of that. So uh, consider checking out one of our episodes because we have now over 280 episodes. That's over 560 hours of content. So much content. So uh, continue with us there. But we're also kicking some major butt over on our social media is facebook.com slash comic book click, Instagram at comic book click, or you can use the hashtag comic book click to talk about the newest hostilities and greatest things to come to comic books and comic book media. We're doing some really cool things over there. So um, try to get on the bandwagon before the bandwagon gets full. We're also at Major Issue CBC on Twitter and at Major Issue CBC on Twitch. And to be honest, I got to get back on Twitch. I got to get back to showing you people. Uh, now that I'm back on Spider-Man, maybe that's what everybody's talking about. We can head over there before Spider-Man 2 comes out or quite frankly play spider-man 2 you when gotta get on, on you twitch. gotta get on twitch man you gotta get on because you know what we're gonna do soon is we could definitely do some crossovers with all these games coming out yeah definitely you can definitely get the hands in wwe whenever you want that's never gonna be a thing but <laughs> that's that will never happen on my end i'm i i want i just put it this way last time i was on an online match with uh, a certain person we both know i won four out of the five matches so that's just that's how we roll it no, out here yeah. in these streets. For, for for his for his own sake, I'm not even. I'd, next time, buddy, you'll get him next time. There you go. That's it. Hey, <laughs> and you can always get him next time. And you can always get us next time because there always will be a next time each and every week as we do this free of charge. And considering we do it free of charge, any way that you can support us is uh, welcome and appreciated. Like I said, monetarily by going to our Patreon, Patreon.com/slash/CBCClubhouse, or going to our T Public. Um, and buying some merchandise and getting us money that way. Or you can help and spread the word. Tell a friend to tell a friend about the Major Issues podcast. Uh, and, yeah, we hope to hear from you guys in the future. But mm, my name is George Serrano, a.k.a. The Don. I will always be Dan the comic book man, people. And this has been our Punisher Warzone uh, in memoriam for Ray Stevenson, recap and review. And remember, whether you're a one-man army, a part of the Warriors 3, or dealing absolutes, because my man is still going to be in Ahsoka. Uh, rest in peace, Ray Stevenson. Remember, we are the Click, And always remember that you, yes, you are worthy. <laughs>